So, <laughs> yeah, hi everyone, thank you. Uh, my name's James Leach and I have a recurring nightmare. Uh, I'm on a daytime TV quiz show and the audience have fallen to an expectant push. It all comes down to this. Bradley Walsh is about to ask me a £5,427 question. And here it is. Paul McCartney or Angela Lansbury. What do you mean? I say. What, what is that picture of? Where is it taken? What magnification? What sort of camera? I panic and I blow out an answer just before the buzzer runs out. But I'm wrong. Bradley Walsh shakes his head in disappointment. I've lost my chance of fame. I've lost my chance of fortune. And I've lost my dignity. Then Bradley Walsh turns into a vampire and turns my throat out. And I wake up in a cold sweat. I'm sure we've all had that dream. <laughs> well, I'm here today to tell you that, although for us, this is just a bad dream, in the world of image analysis for cancer pathology, this situation is a nightmare we ask our algorithms to contend with every waking epoch of their existence. This nightmare is the challenge of multiple instance learning. It's a sick, twisted amalgam of several different niche machine learning topics, each of which would be a PhD thesis in its own right, pressurised by the demands of medical technology where the standards are high and the punishment for failure is death for the algorithm and its patients. Life for a multiple instance algorithm is hard, but help is on the way. I want to talk to you today about why multiple instance learning exists and why we use it, why it can be so complicated to be solved, and the work going on to change the lives of these multiple instance learning algorithms forever. Multiple instance learning is required because in fields like cancer pathology, the images we're dealing with are enormous. So a typical cancer biopsy can easily be about three gigabytes worth of image. That's way too big for any reasonable person to pack a batch worth of files onto a graphics card and run a training loop. So, unless you're a Romanian Bitcoin farming magnate, you have no choice but to take your big image and slice it up into tiny little pieces, tiles of the image, and then train a classifier to learn to make predictions based on these little windows of the image, these tiles, rather than the slide as a whole. And you have to accept the consequences of this practicality. We can see some of the problems that you come across by trying to solve the question, smiling or not smiling. So here's my, my input slide, which I'll split into tiles, and there's probably a problem that's immediately jumping out here, which is that for all the tiles in this image, there's probably only about two of them, which actually tell us any sort of useful information about whether the person's smiling or not, or what we say contains the smiling signal. The trouble is, in this formulation, multiple instance learning is what's called a weekly supervised problem. That means that the ground truth for each of these tiles is set based on the ground truth for the image as a whole. So that means every single tile is a smiling tile. So from the point of view of your algorithm in training, even this random patch of forehead must contain vital smile signal information which must be learned and understood. This means that your algorithm is going to go ghost hunting, searching for a signal which isn't there and ruining its real world performance in the process. The second problem is that you lose a lot of spatial context. So for example, if your algorithm saw half a, half a smiling mouth, a quite sensible relationship you hope you want it to learn was to go and search for the other half of that mouth. But the way that we've set up our problem, each of these tiles is treated as a completely separate entity, divorced from its original context. So this sort of reasoning across different areas of the slide isn't possible anymore. So we've seen why multiple instance learning exists is because we're dealing with massive images and we have to do this process of chopping them up. It adds a lot of noise to our training data and we lose the ability to learn uh, relationships we'd otherwise want to. But let's say, even given, that, given those limitations, we've trained this tile level classifier, what do we end up then with in inference? So when we get our input slide, our image of a smiling person, or our cancer biopsy, we split that into tiles. Each of those tiles is run through our trained model. What we end up then is a set of tile level results, so results for these individual chunks of the image. And to get the overall answer, we need to find some way to aggregate those time level results into a single answer. The way you do that is very context dependent and there's no obvious straightforward way to do it. So for example, if the features that you're looking for in your input slide or input image are things you would expect to see fairly uniformly distributed across the slide, it might be quite sensible to do something like count the classifications and take the majority vote, or do some sort of average of the probabilities across the tiles and then take that as your slide level answer. If the features you're looking for uh, are quite localised, for example, like our smiling example, where we only have two smiling tiles, really, what you might do is apply an idea a bit like an activation function. 
So negative titles, because we know there's going to be loads of them, have a relatively smaller weighting in the overall vote, whereas a, a, a positive tile has an, uh, an amplified weighting. So maybe one positive tile is the equivalent of 10 negatives. This is a way of liking our spam example to kind of raise the signal above the noise. If you're in an industry where you're really worried about false positives, so for example, uh, saying someone doesn't have cancer when they do have cancer, which is obviously incredibly, essentially very dangerous, it could lead to you sending someone home who needs to go into hospital and needs some sort of treatment. What you might do is kind of play it safe. So what you can say is that in your bank of title number results, even if there's even one tile which is classified as positive, the whole thing is classified as a positive example. So these are all quite sensible solutions, and I'm pretty sure all of them to some in some variation have been applied in, in industry properly. The trouble is that when you're trying to make this decision, you kind of need some a priori knowledge about the problem you're trying to solve in order to decide which of these approaches you want to go with. So for example, imagine I had a train carriage full of people, each of whom I had tested for some disease. I might ask you, my algorithm, based on these test results, to tell me whether I need to send everyone who was on that train carriage away for, for a quarantine. If I told you I had one positive test result and the disease I was testing for was Ebola, you would probably, and quite reasonably, tell me that everyone on that train carriage needed to be quarantined. That's because you know that Ebola is both infectious and very deadly. But what if I told you I had five positive results? but the disease I was testing for was West Yorkshire Trifle Bronchitis. What would you make of that? Would you launch with a rocket directly into the sun, or would you send them on with a packet of strepsils? So that's the, the second big difficulty the multiple instance learning presents for us. So it's difficult to train our time level classifier to begin with, and there's lots of challenges with that. But then even once we've done that, we then have to do, this, do the work of figuring out this aggregation process, where there's no obvious straightforward answer, the, the only way to get there is the hard craft of talking to subject matter experts and reading a lot of papers. So we think why for a multiple instilling algorithm is really difficult. It's a hard thing to be. But there is work going on which is going to improve the lives of these algorithms going forwards. What is that? So there's lots of promising looking methods using a concept called contrastive learning, which looks like it's a, a promising way forward in this domain. The advantage of using contrastive learning is a self-supervised learning technique. Uh, that means that uh, you you learn you develop a feature extractor which learns the key features of your domain by comparing your input images, so the type the individual tiles, to each other, rather than some external ground truth label. This is really advantageous in this in this situation because, like we saw in that smile example, we don't necessarily trust the ground truth labels we're getting for every individual title, and now we don't have to worry about it. So in grossly oversimplified terms, what happens in contrastive learning is images coming in pairs. Each image has an augmentation applied to it, and then it's passed through what an encoder decoder model. So that means that the image comes in, it's encoded into a feature map, a big array of numbers, and then encoded back into uh, decoded back into an image again at the other end. And what we do is we compare two outputs at the end of the model. What we're looking for in a contrastive learner is to get it going such that when the two input images we're passing are the same, the outputs of the models are images which look as similar to each other as possible. And if the two input images we originally had are different images, then the outputs of the two models are images which are maximally different. The thinking behind this is that if you've got a model which can reproduce an image at the appropriate time, it means that it must be being able, in the feature extraction stage, the encoding part, to select, pick up and select the key features of your input image. So for example, in this one, we see, these aren't really these fake ones, but uh, you see the collar, the arm in the air, and something that looks like a guitar, or uh, apparently also a suitcase, uh, is picked up from, at the feature extraction stage. So it's not been encoded back together perfectly as an image, but we don't care about it really, we care about the encoding part of it. What we're going to do is, now we're confident that the feature extraction stage of this model has learned the key features of our domain, we're going to chop the model in half, throw away the encoding bit, and we're going to take the first half, uh, the part which turns the input image into a feature vector, as the first stage in our new next generation pathology model. And this opens up a world of extra benefits for us. 
So it changes the way our training loop works now. So now, instead of having to uh, make uh, predictions of the individual tiles, what, we're, what we do now is we take our input slide, we chop it up into tiles, each of these tiles is passed through our new contrastive linear feature extractor. That gives us a big set of feature maps. But feature maps are lots of other images. That means that what we can do, we have enough memory spare now to be able to take all those individual tile feature maps and staple them back together again to get uh, a feature map representation of the whole slide in one object. Effectively, what we're doing is using our contrastive blurring feature extractor as a, a fancy form of image compression. Now what we're able to do is pass this compressed version of our slide into a second model, which does our actual prediction. So smiling or not smiling, tumor or not tumor. This has three big benefits for us. Firstly, we've now unlocked the ability to make for our model to learn relationships based on uh, features which appear in different parts of the image. So it can see uh, compare mouth and the soft squinting of the eye is a sensible relationship we might want to learn for whether someone's smiling or not. Secondly, unlike before, when we were training the model and we had bad ground truth labels which kind of distorted our training results, we didn't trust the ground truth labels at the tile level. By the slide level, we do trust them. So now our training setup makes a lot more sense. Uh, it should give us uh, more consistent results and more performant results at the other end of it. The final result is all that uh, tile aggregation stuff we talked about, and Ebola and trifle bronchitis, we don't need to worry about that anymore. We have our model set up in such a way that one slide comes in and one simple answer comes out to the end. We basically removed the last third of our algorithm. So, what have we learned in this lightning talk? You've seen that multiple instance learning is required uh, in areas like cancer pathology where we're dealing with massive images. This requires us to chop massive images into smaller images that, we're, that are bite sized and easy to handle. This has the disadvantage of adding a load of noise to our training data and removing the ability to learn spatial relationships based on the whole slide. It also makes us rely on complicated aggregation processes, which either require a lot of hard work or a lot of excessive experimentation to dial in. But there are exciting new methods on the horizon using ideas like self supervision and contrastive learning, which looks set to be able to let us sidestep all of those issues. So, life for machine learning out the uh, business learning algorithm is hard, but there's hope on the horizon. So, please help out today by contributing to multiple instance learning research. With your five pounds a month, we can make a real difference to an algorithm near you. With your donation, you'll receive a free welcome pack regular updates from your neural network, and the satisfaction of knowing you are contributing to faster, safer, and cheaper cancer care for everyone. Thank you very much.